All right. Um, so I'm gonna let's go and get started. So welcome back. Hopefully everybody's getting off to a good start this week, this semester. Um uh, let's see here. Uh, announcements. Um, so I know some people had asked some questions about getting their Python environment set up. I haven't been able to to help people with that too much yet, but keep working on that. I mean, you know, like I think I mentioned last time, really is a a good goal. You should make certain that you have something by the end of this week, if at all possible, so you can start working on assignments and and doing the lecture notebooks and stuff like that. If you don't, you really should. You know, uh, let me know what issues you're having. Come see me. I still have office hours today um, after this class. Um, I've got some things set up on Friday. I could uh, set up some face-to-face -face on Friday as well if people need that. So I am over in Science 355. Um, if you want me to take a look at your setup uh, or have some other questions. So, um, but, but yeah, you really, really do need to get going on that if you don't have something up and working that you can that you think you can use. Um, so make certain that you are doing the readings, make certain you have the textbook. Um, although, you know, we're really just um, um, kind of doing Python uh, this week and next. But, uh, you know, you should, if you don't have the textbook already, you should get it and get that first chapter read and, and start um, uh, looking at um, that and some of the other things that I mentioned. So um, the um, you know I'll remind you that I do have a due date. Um, um, I might not have it visible yet. So um, um, I, I do have assignment one currently um, on the seventh. So that is um, I meant to do that on the eighth. I'll go ahead and fix that. So I am kind of looking for this assignment one. Uh, at the end of next week, uh, it's mostly on Python and stuff. So, so you should cover the stuff in uh, in there. Uh, although, um, it's yeah, it's on that and like the scientific Python stack. So this week is you know I gave you some materials to look at basic Python. Next week is kind of NumPy and SciPy and stuff like that. So, but uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, I'll get that fixed on the day. So I, I do want that by the end of next week, uh, Friday. For, for, uh, it's going to be the due date for that if I don't have that up yet. Uh, there is already that assignment one um, is, you know, already showed that. Um, so once you've cloned the repository, um, you know, there are assignments on there. Uh, I'm not going to modify that one. So if you, have, you can get started on the assignment one, you can use the ones in the uh, repository right now for, um, for the um, assignment one, right? So like, like I mentioned before, uh, don't work too far ahead. I've, um, I might be changing or modifying stuff on assignment two, or, or, or which I'll let you know when it's safe to, you know, if I've made any changes on things. But assignment one, we'll go ahead and use what we've got there right now. Um, so my plan for today uh, might be a little bit light. We'll see if people have questions or things, but uh, I thought I would talk a little bit about Python. Um, also, maybe continue giving some hints about using Jupyter Notebooks and things, features of that. So I know that can be useful for productivity and stuff. I, I rushed through a couple of things last time, at least stuff that I find useful, like the um, context-sensitive help and um, some of the basics of, of some of the keyboard shortcuts and using cells and things. So I can talk some more about that if, if uh, people have some questions on those. Um, um, and you know, I'll remind again, so you know, basically I had asked you to maybe look through the first seven or eight chapters of that thing, Python book. I mean, you know, that's seven or eight chapters. I'm not expecting you to read everything on there, but um, you know, that will give you the basics. So you should have enough of a background to be able to look at that and pick up the bit the things you need on Python, which is, you know writing functions and loops and things. So the basics of the syntax and also the, the things like the, the data structures and stuff. Um, I've got, so I want to talk probably mostly about some of those things today, just for people that maybe haven't used Python before. So I don't really exactly expect it, but I do expect that um, you have enough of a background that, that this week you can kind of get up to speed and, and at least 
know enough to be able to understand the the code in the lecture notebooks and the uh, assignment stuff that that I ask you to do. Um, and of course, you know, write, you know, so for this first week, you know, you just need to know how to write basic functions and uh, use things like basic lists in Python and um, some other stuff like that. Um, so. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so like I started saying, um, you know, for this week, the, besides the Think Python textbook, uh, the other, so there are three notebooks out here. So I'm, I think I'm mostly, I've, I've got lecture videos where I kind of go through these, uh, but I think I'm mostly going to uh, go through these uh, so I can talk about some of the fundamental, fundamental things of Python that I, that um, everybody should be familiar with uh, in order to um, start, you know, doing the machine learning uh, assignments uh, and understanding the code in our machine learning textbook when you do the lecture readings and stuff like that. So, um yeah, I showed this before, you know, um, you know, a, a feature that I find useful um, for the newest versions of the Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Hub environments, um, the, the outline. So it gives you, a, if you're correctly using your markdown cells and using the, the headers, you know, you get a good outline. That's an easy way to look through the, the content, uh, the stuff on the notebooks and things. Um, so... Uh, I'll probably skip over, you know, uh, I'll assume that in pr previous programming languages you've done, that you understand how to write um, expressions uh, for statements like arithmetic statements and other kinds of expressions like that, right? So if you're familiar with like C or Java or something like that, the, the syntax is pretty much the same uh, in, tr in terms of like the operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Um, there are a few things that you might not have in other languages like C or things. So, you know, there is a built-in you know, raised to a power, raised to an exponent, and use the two stars to, um, to square something in this case. Um, um, so it, it uses two stars, like two multiplications, rather than the caret, which some languages use that for uh, a built-in raised to a power. The, the, the usual order of precedence uh, apply that you should be familiar with and you should know what I mean by that. Uh, but yeah, if you have an expression with multiple statements on it, you know, it's going to uh, do the um, parentheses first and do multiplications and divisions before it does additions and subtractions and uh, raising to a power is going to be higher precedent than uh, multiplication and that kind of stuff, right? So to know what the value of the expression like this, you kind of have to know what order operators will be applied in, right? Starting with the highest um, order is going to be parentheses, that kind of stuff. So I'm taking it, you know, I'm going through this kind of quickly. I, this is the kind of stuff that you should be relatively comfortable with. You should know what I'm talking about. Talk about things like that. Um, Python if you're not familiar with it, is a, um, it, it doesn't, you know, you don't have to declare variables and declare types of variables, the, the type for the variables before you use them, right? So it's not a uh, strictly typed language, but uh, it really is, you know, the, using types um, um, behind the scenes, right? So all, all variables that you create do have a type. It just infers the type from when you create the variable and how you use it in Python. So you don't have to declare things up front, uh, you just start uh, def um, uh, defining a value for a variable that will infer the type and use the type. And it will do kind of conversions between types um, that um, in the same way that languages like C and Java do as well um, for some things. So, so anyway, that real quickly, right? So um, um, if you give values, they're kind of like an integer format. It will infer and use an integer data type behind the scenes. And so you got floating point values. Um, the string type is a built in data type in Python. So many languages, uh, newer languages, will usually have string data types, even though they're more complex than fundamental types like floats and ints, uh, but they will be built in as a basic type of language. Python has that. Although, you know, if you use C or uh, other languages, you know, in earlier languages, that was a type that wasn't really fundamental as, as a basic type in the language. Right? But, but you have strings and they're very powerful in Python. Um, they're actually a type of a sequence uh, as, as 
I think we'll see is if you go through these notebooks, you'll see uh, what we mean by that. Uh, Boolean types are a fundamental type. You should use Boolean variables when um, um, you're actually doing stuff with Boolean flags, things. I mean, like in C, you know, I, I see people use things like one and zeros to mean true and false. You should get out of that habit when you're using a high level language that has actual real Boolean types. Um, so um, you do have... Um, And there are, you know, keywords true and false if you want to define like a Boolean variable. So I could create variable X with a value of true, um, for example. Um, so here's an example of how it infers uh, the type that's not big enough. I guess big enough, right? Can people in the back see that fine? Um, so if I, you know, so I don't have to declare the type for X before I use it. I can just assign something to it. Um, and Python for since I use the the true, which is a keyword indicating a Boolean value, um, it infers that we're going to create variable X uh, using a Boolean type behind the scenes. Um, so I think I probably already talked about these. So some more examples of assignments. Um, so in the one case, we're going to have string assigned, the other case is going to infer an integer, and the other case is going to infer a, um, um, a floating point number here. Um, so the message is string, pi is going to be I don't know, float. Um, yeah, I don't know if, how much probably lots of stuff here. Um, I mean, the usual kind of rules that you should be familiar with from like C or Java or something apply to names. So, you know, you can't actually, you can use lowercase, uppercase letters, a few special symbols like underscore for variable names. You can use numbers, but you can't start a variable name with a number. That's a syntax error. Um, um, there are some special characters, but not all special characters. Underscore dash can be used for variable names, but um, not very much else. Um, and like most languages, there are keywords. Uh, um, I don't think I give a list of all the keywords that Python uses, but you can't reuse a keyword. A class is a keyword for defining classes in Python, so you can't create a variable with that name, uh, so. Um, oh yeah, so your very first kind of uh, question or two, in the, you know, just the first question is about writing a function. Um, so I do kind of assume that people are comfortable with how you write functions in programming languages, why you do that, right? So we emphasize a lot of you know, using functions correctly and well um, in this class and in, in, um, um, in various contexts. Um, like most programming languages, um, uh, Python is fundamentally object-oriented behind the scenes. So it provides uh, functions and libraries of functions that you can use. Um, so a lot of the stuff you can do in, in Python, especially the, the basic built-in things are, will, give, will be given to you as functions, right? So when I used the type before, that's actually a function that was defined in Python uh, that takes one input parameter and it determines what the type is of that variable or, or of that constant expression and returns the, um, um, the type. Right, so uh, uh, 42 is going to be interpreted as an integer um, type. Um, something with quote, single or double quotes around it would be interpreted as a string type. Um, this is just a bit of an aside, but um, uh, Python supports both single or double quotes. Uh, 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 there's no real difference between those. So um, um, uh, so if you want a string, you can use double or single quotes. But of course, you have to use... If I use a single quote to start a string, I have to, I have to close it with a string. Uh, 
most languages you can only use one or the other, but not not both. So this does make it possible so that uh, an easy way to get like a double quotes instead of a, a string constant um, is I can use the single quotes and put the double quotes in there to get um, a quote character inside. So. Um, so anyway, yeah, print is another built-in function. Um, um, some examples of some built-in functions for converting things between types. So, um, you know, so we're converting integers to floats and strings to integers and things like that. So, um, Uh, I kind of skipped over it. Uh, uh, there was another operator that, um, so the versions of Python 3 support two kinds of versions of, of division. Um, um, so, I mean, it used to be that, uh, anyway, so if you use like a single slash, um, even if both of the values are integer, uh, it will default to doing floating point division uh, in Python now. It, 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 you need to be using Python 3, right? So, so what happened there was uh, if you tried this in like C or something um, and you give it two integer parameters, you'll get a result of um, you know, a zero. Or if you do something like uh, 15 divided by seven, you get a result of two or, or, um, integer division. And, uh, chop off any fractional part. Uh, if you want to force inner division nowadays in Python, use two slashes. This will say um, uh, keep the result as an inner division. So that's useful. Just if you, you'll probably see that in some of our uh, assignments or tests. Um, so um, there is uh, a modulus operation uh, which gives the remainder of doing a division, right? That's the same as in most languages that I assume most people are familiar with. Um, div mod is another example of a function that's built in. So this will, will give you both the um, um, the result of the division uh, plus the remainder. Um, so you get the result of the division first and the result of and any remaining uh, values from the integer division as the second return value. Uh, I'm probably skipping ahead here, but you know, you may or may not be surprised by this. Where, um, unlike some languages, you can return uh, kind of more complex types. So this is one of the ways that we return multiple results from a function. I'm gonna probably gonna be talking about that more here uh, later on. So we're actually returning two results here as a list or as a tuple, um, or the the built-in div mod is doing that. So it's returning, you know, the the result of the division and the remainder from the division um, from calling that there. That's we'll be using that a lot, returning multiple results. So we'll see that. Um, well, you probably have to use that in the first assignment. Okay, so let's, let's get into some, some more useful stuff. So um, uh, there are lots of built in things. Uh, in fact, I, I kind of skipped over it, but uh, you know, if you're interested, uh, one built in function is dir which actually directory i guess but it actually gives a list of all the things um oh no that's not so there's a way to get a list of, of all the built-in functions these are the things that were, are currently defined in my current environment so i'm mostly seeing um like the variables i defined and things um, um how do you i, I i'm not gonna so if you're interested in seeing everything that's loaded it might be under the built-ins um Yeah, so I think that's um, those are the, all the the built-in functions that aren't kind of really they're they're just in the, the language just in basic Python instead of having to load a library uh, to get the the function. So all the things I think that I talked about should show up in there in the uh, built-in namespace that I just listed or directory, right? Including uh, type and int and um, div mod, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
so anyway, but uh, you know, like most languages, uh, Python is considered very powerful uh, be for one reason because of its extensive set of libraries uh, that you can use, right? So instead of having to reinvent the wheel, very large numbers of things that you might want to do have already been implemented for you for, as, as algorithms in um, um, uh, libraries. It, it, Python calls these uh, uh, modules, basically. The same idea, library modules, things like that. If you want to use um, functions or classes or other things defined in a module, use the import statement in Python. So this will import the basic math library, or basic uh, math module um, by doing this. Um, I mentioned before, so, so Python is, is kind of fundamentally object oriented. So, and it also uses namespaces, which is another concept that you, you know, probably run across uh, the kind of idea. So whenever you import something basically like this, it actually imports all the things defined in that library in a namespace, right? So, so uh, all these functions for the math library, they're not imported directly into my into one global namespace. They're in a namespace called math, right? So it, to invoke uh, a member function or a member of a module, uh, you have to use the dot notation, which is pretty common in most programming languages that I assume that you're familiar with. So for example, um, there are some constant values defined in the math library, like pi and e, and I can't remember, uh, uh, but uh, again, we could use that directory command that I showed real quickly. Um, so if I list out everything defined in math, oh, I never, I didn't run that cell yet. So uh, let's run the import and actually import it. Um, so yeah, I can't really tell which things are functions and which things are uh, constants, but um, uh, we got E and, um, and pi and a couple others, I think, well, that are constants, right? So anyway, right, so you can ask for the cost of pi and, uh, using the dot, right? So so uh, for many programming languages, uh, if you want to access a member inside of a namespace, or a member inside of a class, it's, you know, the class or namespace name, dot, and then the thing inside of that namespace that you want to access. So that's what we're doing here. Um, and we can use functions as well. So um, you know, all the, the basic math functions um, uh, are in there. So science, design, logarithms, um, uh, uh, tangents, uh, absolute values, factorial, floor, ceiling, you know, lots, lots of different basic mathematical operations uh, are part of this math library. So here, you know, we just uh, simply um, calculated the base 10 logarithm of some value. Or, you know, given the sign of the value or something like that. Um, I don't remember if I go over this. The, the textbook probably goes over this. Uh, there are different ways to import, and you'll see this in the uh, lecture notebooks um, that we use. So um, you can do things like this, use a from statement to import stuff into a different namespace. You shouldn't do this for our class. This is usually kind of frowned upon, except in specific case. What happens here though, is everything in the math namespace gets imported, uh, or I can import a specific thing. So if I wanna only import the tan H, function from the math library, I can import it. So what will happen is tan h would be imported into my current global namespace, right? So the result of doing that, um, if, I, if I list all the things that are defined here, I should have like a tan h among other stuff, variables and stuff I've defined. Um, and now I can use tan h, um, directly. Uh, that's considered bad practice because the reason why you have namespaces is so you don't have conflicts 
if I import this and if I import everything from some other library, they might use the same name for something and then you don't know which version of something you're using. Um, so what, uh, something that you will see a lot, uh, this is just convention. I don't know if I like this or not, uh, but um, inside of notebooks, especially, I guess uh, a lot of like, the scientific and machine learning libraries use abbreviations. So instead of having to type out numpy, dot, whatever, all the, everywhere, uh, they often import it into abbreviated name for the namespace. So you can import something uh, into and give it a, a different name. So the common thing is just to use a shorter name for a namespace. So we use that a lot. So uh, this is getting to next week, but uh, NumPy is often NP. Um, Matplotlib is often NP. Uh, I can learn. Um, um, it's often SK, stuff like that. So, um, I think there's no hyphen in the, the name for scikit-learn. So, uh, it's SK-learn, I think. There we go. Um, anyway, so, you know, that, I guess, just wanted to mention it because that allows you to... Um, um, specify uh, functions in, in a namespace, but using abbreviations and it's very common. And all the notebooks that we use tend to use stuff like that. So, um, um, we'll, we'll talk about NumPy next week. I don't really want to get into it today. So, um, but um, All right, it'd be, you know, be comfortable with, you know, more complex ways of evaluating expression, right? So this is just pointing out that, um, you know, uh, this is a fundamental thing of how functions work. So most functions, you're passing one or more parameters that return a result. Um, so, you know, you can compose functions inside of functions, inside of other functions, nest them, things like that. So, you know, if I want to, um, 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 find the log of x um, and um, I haven't defined degrees yet here. It must be defined somewhere up above. So the dangers of just doing things uh, um, one by one. Let's say degrees is 33. So actually the log and the exponent are uh, the name. They are inverse of each other. So if you take the log of something and then redo it with the exponent and get back the same value. But in this case, we're calling a function, the ret function returns a result that gets passed. You know, so the log function returns a result that gets passed the exp function. Right? So uh, hopefully this, this seems kind of basic for most of you, but you know, um, uh, uh, Understanding this, you know, kind of deeply will help you uh, read a lot of the code that's done um, in this class for textbooks and stuff. So make use of all these kinds of things. Um, so that, let's let's talk about creating new functions. Um, so a good function, uh, we mostly this course has ma a mathematical kind of emphasis, mathematical kind of bent, you know. So we use a lot of functions in this class in the mathematical sense. So they transform one or more inputs uh, and map that into an output, right? So that, that's really kind of what a mathematical function is. Uh, and, and functions in programming languages kind of can do the same things, although they, they, they uh, break that a little bit. So the most basic thing for doing a function, I mean, you, know, you can do side effects. So for example, this function here, uh, we can define so the keyword def is used for defining a function. Uh, so, like most programming languages, you have to provide three things for a function the name of the function, which is this part here. Um, any input to the function goes between the parentheses. So, C and Java and things use the same kind of syntax. So, in this case, and if you don't have any parameters, 
it has to be empty, right? So if I don't have any input to the function, uh, what, you can have functions that don't have any input like this one. Uh, you just leave those empty. Um, and also um, functions can return values in Python. Um, although again, since Python doesn't use strong typing, you don't have to declare the, the return type for a function. You just use the return statement. So, but, but also a function doesn't necessarily have to return anything um, for in a programming function like this. So they're not mathematical in that sense. So um, anyway, so yeah, the most basic idea, th this function um, as a side effect displays things on standard output using the print statement, um, but it doesn't return anything, right? So, um, so you can declare a function like that. Um, um, and this is similar to C and Java and lots of languages. If I've declared a function, um, I can call it by using the name and then passing in parameters if it takes any. Right. So by so after I define it or declare it, uh, this is actually invoking it. Right. And what we're seeing on on the output here is the side effects of the print statement running uh, inside a function. Right. So uh, if you do something like this, so. Uh, if I try to get the return value, so, so normally when functions return values, uh, often we need to keep track of that, save that value so we can do something with it, some other calculation, right? So you do the same thing uh, in Python like you can do in most languages. So assign the return result from a function into a new variable like x here. Um, so you still get the side effects. So, so the prints still go to standard output, uh, but in this case, since we're not returning any results, um, the functions actually do return something. Uh, but if you don't return anything, it returns a special value you know, or a non-value. So, so actually all functions in Python are actually value returning functions. But if you don't specify anything, it uses this none value, which I don't know. Um, you, you'll probably have to use that for different contexts. But, but that's one of the keywords, one of the things that is defined uh, in the Python language. Um, um, of course, you know, one of the fundamental things of using functions is functions can use other functions. So that's how you de decompose big problems in, uh, you know, they're very complex. You write a function uh, that, that solves the big problem, uh, but then you write smaller sub-functions that, small, that, that solve smaller bits of the functions and maybe even sub-sub-functions, right? So, so anyway, I mean, you can call their functions inside of functions to uh, calculate results. Um, so, excuse me for a second. I want to remember something here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I do kind of want to get into talking about like some of the data structures and things. So let's see how much. Okay, yeah. So just a few more things. Um, so um, I kind of jumped into functions. Kind of we, we skipped over, you know, like loops and things like that. Um, so the only things we haven't really talked about for functions yet are. Example passing in parameters. Um, so, you know, in this case, we have a function that takes in a single parameter. So again, notice we're not declaring a type. Um, uh, so whatever we pass in, uh, uh, we're just passing uh, right to the print function. So the result is, you know, whatever we pass in gets um, displayed twice on standard output in this little simple example, right? But notice, I mean, one of the points of this is that uh, since Python is not strong in types, uh, it doesn't matter if we pass in other types, as long as the print function can handle it, this function works fine to print it out twice, right? And most values know how to display themselves on standard output if you pass them to print in Python, right? So, you know, if we pass in a string, we get the string out. So if we pass in an integer, uh, it still works fine. Um, so, so now when we call it the second time, Bruce is actually holding an integer value um, and it gets the integer value passed out, printed out twice, and a flow pipe value and so on. Um, passing a Boolean value. 
a complex number. Um, I should, uh, what you do have to use a little bit of something with complex numbers in the assignment. Um, blank, I'm trying to remember the, the syntax of the uh, syntax for complex numbers. It's like an integer plus, uh, uh anyway, so we'll see some examples of that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show some of that next week. I think for the third question, you have to do something with some. So complex numbers are actually a built-in type in Python. So not a lot of, not very many languages support that as a built-in fundamental type. So can't remember the syntax on that at the moment. Um, okay, and you know, so I think I've already probably. I was talking about returning values from functions. So really, in our class, it's not really a good idea to write functions that don't return a result. We mostly use functions in that kind of sense. We'll definitely see a lot more of that. Like next week, I'll talk about um, uh, like plotting and 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 uh, this idea of functions and things. Um, so most of the the time when we create functions in this class. We're going to be doing uh, the the Think Python book calls these fruitful functions, but uh, uh, that just means functions that return uh, a result. So normally we take inputs, we calculate or map those then to an output and return the output as the result from calling the function. So, um, So I thought I had better examples of, of like a, of, of a function that returns a result. So um, I know I got this summer, must be in a different notebook, one of these different three notebooks, but uh, like if I want to calculate the area of a circle with a radius, Do something like that. Pi r squares, the radius of a circle. So, you know, um, more mathematical function, but um, 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 given something like that, uh, we can ask what's the area uh, of a circle with a radius of three. Right, so um, must have mistyped that. Like that right? So in this case, just real quickly, I thought I had a better example of uh, kind of something calculating, you know, mapping a result. So here we take some integer or float as input, we calculate the area using the standard uh, area of a circle formula, uh, and just return that. So the, I guess the only new thing there is if you do need to return an explicit result. The return statement is uh, uh, needed uh, to specify what gets returned from the function. Um, okay, so let's see here. What else? So, rest of the stuff I think I'll go through real quickly here. Uh, again, most of the stuff I hope is familiar. Um, so you have to understand how to do uh, conditions or Boolean expressions in order to write loops, uh, you know, so to have conditional statements or um, um, in your programming language. So, so all of the same things that most people are probably familiar with with C and Java are supported. Um, so you can compare whether things are equal. We use the two equals, which Python is, is derived from C. So, so a lot of the syntax, especially for expressions and things, um, um, is, is still the same, right? So, you know, uh, uh, two equal signs, if you want to do a Boolean comparison is equal, um, you've got uh, the, the exclamation, the bang equals for not equals, um, um, although not is a keyword as well, but um, um, so or less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to are all supported. And so, so if we have um, X is five and Y is seven, uh, 
Um, you, know, you can do all those. Notice that it res returns a Boolean result. So you get true or false when you do uh, uh, Boolean operations. Um, and of course you can use uh, 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 logical operations and or not. Although here the syntax is a little bit different or at least the original old C used kind of mnemonics for these, but Python doesn't really have those. Um, I don't think it supports those. Uh, we, can, we can test that real quickly. Um, I can't remember, but um, like if we have uh, N is 42, um, you know, so this was comparing whether the remainder is uh, by, divided by two is whether the value divides evenly by two or three. Basically, if I was to read that in English, right, using the or operator. Um, you may be familiar with, if you come from other languages, um, uh, a lot of them still use these old mnemonics like, like this for or. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we don't have those. So, so and or not, uh, you have to use instead um, if you want to do combinations of Boolean expressions. Um, all right, and then, you know, um, so there are if else, if then else statements in Python. So you can do, do a basic thing. So like for most languages, uh, use if, um, don't, you shouldn't use the parentheses like you do in Python or Java around your Boolean expression. Um, although usually it doesn't hurt. I'm talking about that, uh, but um, so I don't expect those. It might cause problems in some places. Um, uh, I, I think I kind of skipped over. I, for, I forgot, like when we looked at the function, you already saw that. So any time you're creating a block of code, uh, Python uses a colon at the end to start a block, right? So what we were doing before, when we used the def statement, the, the def statement for functions ended uh, with a um, colon, um, Um, here, I didn't mention that before, but that means, so whenever you have colons in Python, that means the, the stuff after that uh, is a new block, and all of that is going to be associated with the, 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 the thing uh, that starts the colon. So in this case, this block code is the code that's executed when the function gets run, right? So that serves the same purposes like the opening and closing parentheses in like a C or Java language. So that actually, the curly braces are. Right. But uh, another thing that, you know, um, is unusual about Python, so, so like in Java or C, uh, you have opening and closing curly braces around the block, around the, the function, the code for the block for the function. Or something like that. Uh, in Java, we don't have a closing thing for a block. It uses indentation, which was kind of novel when Python did it. Still, most things, most things use an open and closing. Most programming languages have an open and closing thing to indicate a block. Python, so for things to be uh, in the same block, they have to be indented the same amount. Right? Uh, and it will be a syntax error if you try to put something in there that doesn't have the right indentation. Right? So since I started off with like four spaces, uh, try to make a new block, only using one indentation is inconsistent. Um, and I believe you should get a syntax error from that, an indentation error. Um, but I, I went off on that because, um, I mean, you know, the same concept is happening here. So if we have a condition statement, like an if, um, uh, we define the stuff that should be executed if that condition is true as a block that tap that comes after the if state after the colon for the if statement, right? So everything that's in the block after that colon for the if statement would be executed, um, like on this one, if that condition is true. So since x is five, um, it's true that it's greater than zero, and it's true that it's less than ten. So it should execute all these three statements that are in the block of this Python code uh, after the colon for the if statement. Um, uh, 
So, um, so yeah, every time you have a block, it's always going to be ended with a colon, and then the stuff that's in the block, of course, by that, should always have the same information. Of course, like other languages, you can nest those. I can I probably have examples of that below here. So you can have nested if statements and things like that. Um, there's an if else, uh, and, and actually, um, you know, it's a little bit different than like C, but. Um, um, there's a special keyword for else if. So there's no switch statement in Python. So if you need something with multiple um, else conditions, it's if, else if, else if, else if, else if, and then a final default else if none of the other ones are true before you get down to the else, right? So all these, these else ifs can take an additional uh, Boolean check expression to determine whether it's going to execute that code. And only, the, only the first one that's found to be true is executed like normal for these sort of multi-chain conditions, like a switch statement, but if, if else, else statement. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's really only if um, and else if for condition statements in Python, there's no switch. Um, there are uh, two kinds of main things for looping statements, while statements, and for statements. Um, um, while statements basically work the same way as in my C or Java. So uh, all the code in the block of the while statement will be executed as long as the statement is true, as long as the Boolean condition is true. So um, here in this case, as long as n is greater than zero, it'll keep printing out the value and subtracting one. So the result should be just counts down here. Um, so I'll skip over that. There are break and continue, which you know we may or may not use some um, like in C, first introduced in C as far as I know. Um, I wanted to talk about a for loop. Uh, probably the for loop, we'll go to the next notebook, talks about a for loop. So there's also a for statement, uh, but um, so you know, there's a for statement in C and Java and lots of languages, but it's meant to be used kind of differently than in C. So, uh, so, so we talk, should talk about it specifically. So, um, all right. Oh, and so I mentioned like the first um, the first question in the first assignment does use recursion. So you do have to write a uh, the, the Fibonacci. Actually, the, the version of the Fibonacci that's given to you uh, is an example of a recursive function. Just bring that back up again real quickly. Um, right. So I, I am assuming that you run across the concept of recursion, you know what's happening here. So in this case, we're using a very bad implementation of calculating a Fibonacci number that causes an exponential explosion. So it takes a long time to do this, to calculate big Fibonacci numbers. But but here, so this is given to you, the, the inefficient version. Um, so you know the way recursion works normally, uh, you always have to have a base case, right? So uh, recursion works kind of the same way I've talked about it. It's a way of taking a complex pro problem um, and you specify sub-problems. Right? So to solve a complex problem, um, I might break it down into simpler problems, solve those simpler problems first, and then combine the results of the simpler problems to get my answer. Right? But at some point, you need to get down to a problem that's so simple I can directly solve it. That, that's the basic way that, the uh, that re uh, recursion works. So in this case, a recursive function always has to have a base case, at least one or some base case, which will simplify. So in, in this case, the the uh, result of the, the first Fibonacci number and the second Fibonacci number um, um, are one or two, right? Maybe I'm assuming you know what the Fibonacci sequence is. The Fibonacci sequence is normally written like this. Um, um, it's, it's basically just the the the, uh, the addition of the previous two. A lot of times you'll see that the first two values are defined one. So the the, 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 the 
in this case, we might call this the, the first Fibonacci number, the second Fibonacci number. So, so n is the n measure. So, so each one in the sequence is the result of adding the, the two previous ones. So in this case, the fourth one would be two plus one is three. Fifth one would be five. Um, uh, we define it a little bit differently in here. We just define that um, uh, the, the first uh, phase cases or the first and second Fibonacci number were one and two respectively, but they get the same results um, as like another definition. Have that like the same. So in our case, uh, the first Fibonacci number should return one by definition of the phase case. So the two, and then the rest of these return the result of adding the previous two. The fifth one should be eight, this one should be 15, and so on. Which, um, if we do this for our assignment um, and we check it out, you know, so this is this is the test. And when you write your own version of the Fibonacci number, it should, of course, be getting the same result for all these uh, Fibonacci uh, values in the sequence. So, um, yeah, so one, two, so you should get three for the third Fibonacci number, um, five for the fourth one, and uh, I guess the tenth one is 89. Um, and um, notice, you know, um, it takes an inordinately amount long enough time to actually calculate um, the 37. Oh, well, that looks faster than I thought. Um, it takes a noticeable delay to calculate a bit, and not that big of one, like 37 or something. Right? So, 30, so 37th number in the sequence is that. Uh, if you try to go a little bit bigger, it'll, it'll It'll take exponentially more time, so like forty might not might not might not be able to wait around to see what it's done. Um, all right. Anyway, yeah. So I'm I'm kind of assuming that we've done something about recursion before, but uh, but this is an example of recursive function. Did finish. Um, so if it's not one of those fundamental cases that we just directly solve. You solve it by decomposing the problem into two simpler subproblems. I want to calculate the fourth Fibonacci number. If I know what the third Fibonacci number is, so in the four minus one, if I know what the value is of the third Fibonacci number is, I know what the value of the second Fibonacci or n minus two. If I know those two, um, I get the result of those two, and I can just add those together to get the thing. That's recurring. And this is particularly inefficient because, for example, when I calculate this using my recursion, I recalculate you know, the, the two and the one. Right? If you do that for large numbers, you're recalculating lots of million times when you expand out that recursion there. Um, All right, and I, I guess while I'm on it here, so you know the um, um, we'll, we'll talk more about NumPy and stuff next week. So the rest of these are really some of the the scientific libraries that you know, should be looking at. Um, but um, uh, what you need to do for the first assignment is you need to use a technique called memoization, um, which you know, I encourage you to Google it. I probably have there's probably a link to it somewhere. Um, I thought there was. Um, anyway, yeah, Google it if you want. But basically, what memoization does is we still need to do some recursion, but um, first check, look up the set of recursive decline. I've already calculated a result of this one previously. I just look it back up in the table and use that. So, recalculating you know, that's kind of in a nutshell what, what I'm asking for um, um, for you to actually do on this one. Um, all right.
Okay, yeah, so let's, uh, let's jump to the next one. Uh, I still got 15 minutes or so. Um, There is a whole thing on object-oriented functional programming. Uh, so using object orientation in Python, I'm not going to talk about the day, that today. Actually, I probably won't talk about that at all. Uh, although that material will be useful in order to understand how the scikit-learn library works. So, you know, as I asked for, you should understand the basics of how object-oriented and functional programming work in Python. Um, but let's just mention a, a couple of things. So one of the big powerful things about Python is the data structures that are built in. So besides just you know, the, the numeric types and complex numbers and things, um, it has built in and you know, in strings, it has built in other types that are that are really still fundamental basic types uh, in Python. So lists, dictionaries, we'll use, you need to understand dictionaries, we'll use them a lot, tuples, uh, sets are in there, which we might use a little bit. Um, so I just mentioned that uh, all these these types, well, the the the, um, uh, the list and, and the string, uh, especially uh, in the tuple as well, uh, they're kind of known as sequences in Python. So that means that they are a collection of items, container of items. Where the items have some particular sequence. There's an item at index zero, or the first item, and the next item, the next item. So they're organized in a sequence, right? So really, strings are kind of a sequence. They're a sequence of which all the values in the sequence are characters, or actually Unicode. So Python supports uh, Unicode characters. Um, so that means the things that are sequences, uh, like a string, um, I can I can access a sequence. Using what looks like you, you when you first see this, you'll say, "Oh, that's that's array index, like uh, basic C or Java arrays," right? uh, which is which is true, kind of. Um, but um, um, so you know, since a string is basically a sequence of characters, I can index the item in the string called fruit. The item and and Python uses zero base indexing. When languages don't, Python and Java start at zero, the first item. Um, so if I want the first character in the sequence, I access index zero. If I want the third character in the sequence, I access index two. That's an N. Um, um, unlike a language like C, if uh, it, it does, you know, it. It is a safe type. So if you try and access something that's illegal, it won't go beyond the bounds of the sequence. So uh, so in this case, um, fruit has six character the, the the this variable has six characters. So the only valid ones are actually index zero to index five. All right. So that's that's the last A in there. Um, so if you try to go beyond the bounds of the sequence. So C would have happily allow you to do this because it's big trouble bugs in an unsafe language like C. Um, but um, um, here it, it knows what the length of the sequence is. And if you try to access something that's not a legal uh, index in the sequence, uh, you'll get a it'll generate an exception. I skipped over exception handling, but Python does uh, allow, throws exception and allows you to handle them um, like many languages, newer languages do. Um, but unlike C and Java, Python sequences support uh, a lot of advanced indexes. And this event was actually pulled over in the number. So you'll see a lot of this kind of stuff. So it's good to understand the basics of this here. Uh, you'll see a lot more of it in NumPy. So for example, um, um, the most basic one is what we're doing here, but uh, uh, fruit has a length of five. Oops. So five gets the last character here, but you can use, for example, negative indexing. So if you want to index from the end, if I ask for the negative one, that actually refers to the last character, whatever the length of the sequence is. 
That'll work with NumPy arrays as well. So if I want the last character, I don't have not I don't have to know the length of my sequence or the length of my string. I can just say, give me the last character. If I want the second to last character, I can use negative two, right? Um, and um, um, I'm probably, I'm sure we go into this as well. Another quick one, it also supports something even more powerful known as slicing, which we will use a lot of uh, in this class. So if I have a sequence and I want the characters from two up to four. So the way the slice works is it starts the first character you specify in the slice, the two, uh, the colon means that we're doing a slice instead of getting a single value of the sequence. It goes up to, but doesn't include the four. So it's actually only get, going to get this, the value at index two and the value at index three of the slice. My sequence. So that is, uh, you know, so zero. So that's the N, which is at index two, and the A, this is index three uh, in the slice, right? Or, you know, I can combine that with negative index. So if I want everything from the first one up to, but not including, Second to last one, I can use from one to one to two. All right, so can anybody anticipate which characters that gets? It always includes the first one in the slice. So that means we're going to get the A as the first one. It goes up to, but doesn't include the last one in the slice. So the, the, the minus two means the second to the last one in, so it's not going to include that. So we should get the A and A in this case, Anna, uh, if we slice like that. Um, there's some more things. I think we'll come to those. Um, I sure got 10 minutes here. Um, so, you know, if it's a sequence, that means that there's a length. That's the number of items that's in the sequence. So any sequence, like a string or a list, you can use length if you need to explicitly find out what the length is. Um, I think we mentioned that there because, I mean, you could use the length to do a loop to iterate over the sequence. So, um, So, for, oops. so here all we're doing is grabbing a, a fruit, the variable name fruit still has, um, I'm gonna search somewhere. I just, there's lots of features in these notebooks that, um, that uh, are very useful. So you can search through these for things and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, if the fruit is length six, uh, you can iterate through it backwards. Um, um, although, yeah, if I start at six, I need my, my last index is actually five, so I should subtract one from there. Uh, not quite what I was expecting there, but but um, um, oh uh, yeah, the first six is coming from the X there. So yeah, so for example, you know, you can take have a while loop like that if you're explicitly doing it. So what I'm what I'm working up to is that you know if you're used to a for loop um, if, and and like old style arrays, it naturally the the reason why for loops were originally created in like C is they were meant to iterate over an old style array. So I might do something like uh, the equivalent. Uh, of doing that of an array iteration would be for um, I in range length fruit. So the, the, the length returns six, the range is a built-in function. It actually returns the values of the sequence zero up to, but not including six. So, um, um, so just to show you what range does. You ask for a range of six. Um, oh, that's not what I was thinking. Um, but it basically, it, it's returning. Um, it returns every time you do in range of something. Like the first time you do in, it will return the first value in the range, zero. The second time, one, two, three. It does that up to, but not including the last value you pass in the range. So, 
So um, yeah, Python three has changed a little bit what gets returned when call range, but but that's what will happen in uh, the loop here. So for example, if I just print out I um, the first time when I'm doing the range over six, the first time I is zero, the second time I is one, so on. So then back to finish that up. So in in a, a for loop in C, you know I might print out. Um, Um, the values in the array using i in my loop is explicit in the variable. Uh, not banana, named fruit. Right. So that iterated over the values in the string in the forward direction from index zero up to index five. Right. Um, but as uh, what I was kind of working up to is that um, um, really that's not really the way that for loop is designed to be used. So for loop is meant to be used to iterate over the items in the list, not to be ex explicitly iterating over the indexes in the array. Right? So the real way you should do any, anytime you have a sequence, uh, like a list or a string or a tuple, if I need to iterate over all the items in that sequence, just use this. This this is the 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 um you know this is the uh, the syntax of the, the paradigm that we've been normally use. So if you do for some variable in a sequence, uh, every execution through the loop will be the next value in that sequence, right? Um, so you get the same result as I did this using an explicit index. Um, so since fruit is a sequence of characters, the first time the, the first character B is going to be assigned to, to the variable called letter, and we print out the B and so on. Okay. Um, sometimes you do need that index number, but again, you really shouldn't use an explicit, um, uh, you know, define a variable like I uh, to be the index for um, the items in your sequence. So the enumerate is another built-in that it, that was directly made in case you really do need the index. So if you do enumerate, uh, it actually returns two things. It returns the value at each position in the sequence and it returns the index of that value as the two things from the new. So the, 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 nor the correct, kind of idiom in Python to enumerate over a sequence where I need both the index and the value uh, at each position in the sequence is to use enumerate. You'll see that used a lot in our notebooks. So at so each time through the loop, we get the index of the value in the sequence and the, um, the actual value, all right? Um, and I might have to, talk about dictionaries next week. Uh, let me, uh, I'll probably just um, um, finish up with um, sequences here, uh, with lists here. So, a list is another type of sequence, but it is meant to hold values of any arbitrary type instead of values. So, so the string is a sequence that only holds values of your characters. The list holds a sequence of values, but the values can be any type. Uh, and this is another way that, you know, people that look at this think, oh, well, you know, again, this is an array like in C, but it's not, it, it's, it's more, it's much, lists are much more powerful than basic arrays in like C and Java. Um, so for one thing, the values in, in, in an old style array all have to be of the same type for various reasons. But in Python lists, you can have lists of values of, of any different type. So you can collect all kinds of different things together. So that's what we're doing on this second list here. So these, these are some examples of creating lists. So, you know, the first one, we create a list of four values. That is all the types of the values are integers. The second one is again, four values, but they're all strings. Uh, the third one has what, six values or so. There's a complex number. Oh, it's J instead of I. That's, that's maybe what I was doing wrong. So uh, anyway, so we have like six values, uh, but you know we got some strings, some integers, uh, a boolean result in there, and so on. Um, 
but you can slice these all in the same way that we talked that I talked about before. So if L is this list of values, um, if I want the last value, um, I can use negative one. Oh, notice you can have actually one of the values can be another list. So I'm nesting a list inside of a list. So the first the value at index zero is a string. Value at index one is a float, and then we have an integer. But then the value at index three, or the value at negative one, from the, the last value, um, is actually a, another list in this list here. Um, and if we want to iterate over the values in a list like the the stuff list that I had before, uh, and if we also need the index though, we can use the enumerate again. So here we're iterating over each individual value uh, in stuff that was up there um, and displaying it along with its corresponding index in the sequence there. So. Um, so lists are meant to be mutable, uh, which that means, so things are either mutable or immutable in Python. Uh, if it's mutable, that just means we can modify. We can actually add, remove values, or change existing values in the list. Uh, so the only difference between a list and a tuple is tuples are the same as lists, but they are immutable. Uh, I'll try to talk more about that maybe some other time. But um, that can be useful to create a sequence, but that you can't modify it after you create it, right? But by default, lists are mutable, uh, which means that, uh, just real quickly like this, if I create a list of three strings, uh, that initially has uh, Cheddar, Edom, and Gouda, um, I can actually modify the individual values. So instead of Cheddar, I make my first one a Danish blue cheese and my last one a Stilton, All right? So, so after we modify it, um, so before we modify it, we have Cheddar at index zero and after we modify it. So it's perfectly valid to do that for a mutable sequence. Change and modify the values within the list, right? Um, but you can't do that with a tuple. So if I did the same thing with a tuple, um, so you do a tuple, tuple using a parentheses instead of the, the square brackets. So in this case, um, it's a still sequence, but it's an immutable sequence. So we will get um, an error if you try and do something like um, modify the first value. Okay. Um, and yeah, so I probably have to go ahead and wrap up. So there's other ways you can modify a list, you can um, add operations, you can add new values to the end of it or to the beginning of it, or you can insert values in the middle. Um, I'm sure there's examples of that kind of stuff in here. Um, yeah, so be, usually I have to use list methods for that. So again, you know, Python is object oriented. So if I want to do things like, um, uh, so, so you can also reverse and sort things. But uh, as I started saying, you know, so if I have a list, I want to add the pin items on the end, I can call it pin uh, to put things on the end. Um, and uh, yeah, there's other functions that you can treat lists. So you can use, you can create basic stacks and queues using functions like pop and push, which are provided on lists. So you can get the basic sort of queue and stack data structures. Um, all right. Yeah, and uh, that, that's pretty good for today. I mean, um, um, we will be using dictionaries a lot. I think I will try and talk a little bit about those next time, but uh, make sure you understand dictionaries. Dictionaries are a way to uh, arbitrarily map arbitrary keys to values instead of having the values uh, as a specific sequence or index in the collection. So, but p dictionaries are very powerful. We've used them a lot. So I didn't get to talk about them, but uh all right yep yeah. so i'll go ahead and end it for the day let you guys go um i can stick around for five or ten minutes uh, just remember again i do have 
office hours after this class from like 2 to 3.30 over in Science 255. I know some people are still working on getting uh, a good Python environment up. So if you have a chance, come and let me look at it in person. Uh, if not, you know, if you don't have it up by tomorrow, let me know uh, and tell me what your issue is so I can uh, try and help you or at least know that you're still working on it. All right. Yep. Yeah, thanks. That's it. I'll see you guys next week. Okay. As long as you do a save of the of the file whenever you make a modification. Yeah.